Welcome to the show today. I'm excited to have on someone who's worked on some of the biggest movies ever made, Ted Haynes. He's done special effects for film and TV, and he's old school, and he makes real stuff. Uh, he's, uh, he's done special effects makeup, and I think he's dabbled in sculpting and puppeteering, but his main focus is making things out of foam, and they call that a foam fabricator, and I'll let him explain more about that, but some of the movies he's worked on include Pulp Fiction, The Hunger Games, Avatar, The Muppets, uh, plus he helped make the Iron Man suit. And he's worked on the Mandalorian TV show, a bunch of commercials that you've probably seen. And uh, IMDb has his, some of his credits, but I heard him say that he's worked on over 300 movies. So um, a lot of great stuff. Some of the commercials are like the Kia Hamsters, the Geico Pig, Messing with Sasquatch. Uh, so much stuff. And he's just got some great stories. And I was really entertained hearing them. And I also learned a lot, too. So if you love movies, I think you're going to love this episode. Welcome. Ted Haynes, uh, foam fabricator, which I'm learning a lot about special effects and makeup and costumes and all this. So you can explain to my audience what exactly the foam fabricator does, but that's a big part of what you do, right? It's a huge part of what I do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, as well as like sewing and sculpting and doing all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. but the foam is like, you make those big suits. Is that what, what usually those kinds of things? Yeah. Right here. <laughs> but yeah. And that's, it's, um, yeah, the, the suit. So, I mean, if you think about like, uh, uh, like fat bastard, you know, on, on, uh, the also, I didn't work on that, but yeah. the two shops that I, you know, that did those two different costumes. So usually it's a sculpted layer. And so they, they sculpt it in clay, they mold that and it's a thin skin or, you know, it could be an inch thick or I don't know how big fat bastard was, but then all of that material that goes underneath that, you know, the, the, the big fat suit, that's, the kind of stuff that I do. So like the bean bags and, and making it weighted and, you know, jelly like, and but yeah. then muscle suits as well. I did a lot of the Jack Slink's uh, Bigfoot right. uh, characters for the, the beef jerky. Yeah. Jack Slink. So yeah, a lot of muscle suits. So Bigfoot type suits are just muscly type things. And a lot of the stuff I do get the things that I did for film and, and commercial went underneath you know, to give structure to the, the character. Mm -hmm. But then also foam fabrication is like these dudes I pointed out where these are all completely made out of foam. It's so like upholstery foam and, and like cosplay EVA foam, uh, that kind of stuff. So, and yeah. then coated with latex rubber. Right. So it's interesting um, because, you know, I think so many kids, I mean, what kid doesn't love movies and stuff? And I remember even me as a kid, I'm a terrible artist, but I love to draw and paint. And that's kind of, what started for you is you started, you know, getting interest in drawing and painting. And then Star Wars was the thing that really, you know, right. changed your career path at nine years old. You're like, that's what I'm going to do. Exactly. And it's, I see your poster on the back of your wall. Yeah, there too. So of course. Like, Who isn't I mean, a fan? Yeah. See my stuff on my shelf. Up yeah. There. You win. You've got the better. I have yeah, all those figures like... somewhere in storage. I should break them out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, and that's the story with everybody kind of my age, you know, give or take a few years and, you know, you see Star Wars and it, it, it's not that we haven't seen things like that prior to to when that film came out. Because I was I was always a fan of like the old, uh, you know, the universal horror films or, mm. you know, sci fi films, you know, the day the earth stood still or um, this island Earth or any Star Trek and all that kind of stuff. But Star Wars kind of just threw it in your face in 1977. It was just like, here's something big, something new, because sci fi hadn't been a blockbuster yet you know really that was kind of like that first blockbuster sci-fi that everybody knew what star wars was right you know, even if you just didn't see film you didn't you couldn't help it yeah so then you start to get into movie cameras and stuff and then i love this how old were you you drove from wisconsin to la you're like i'm going for it and you're just taking a chance i mean i hear those stories all the time most of the people i interview do this they take a chance and they yeah they go, fo f you know, follow their dream. And were you 18 at this point? Uh, I, I came out right after I graduated from high school in 86. So I was 18 okay. and did a trip out here with my aunt who brought me out. Um, she had lived out here at one point, was was trying to break into writing and, and TV and things like that. Didn't quite work out. But, you know, she kept contacts out here and she brought me out and just said, you've got to see L.A. You've got to because I already wanted to do this at this mm -hmm. point. I was just like trying to race through school and get done with school so I can get to LA. And so she brought me out here like 80, almost 87. And then I move out here when I'm 19. So about a year okay. later. 
And there wasn't and, many film schools or anything. That wasn't really an option then because there really wasn't a lot of, there was maybe USC, maybe yeah, that was it, right? I, I went to, I mean, as far as film schools, yeah, it's like that type of thing to study camera and photography and things like that. For what I wanted to do, not really. There was two places and I did go to one school and it was like a five month course. And uh, a lot of guys that I, that I met later on, they were like, yeah, I went to that school too. And it was just kind of a, it was an interesting place to be. And it wait, was this nowhere... wasn't the Institute of Studio Makeup, was it? That's that one. Yeah. Okay. That Cause that that's, one. isn't that where you were? I think you, no, I heard no, no, you. No. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. It was called the Institute of Studio Makeup. And they taught like some theater makeup and some prosthetic makeup and uh, like straight makeup, which would just be like what actors wear every day. Um, and so that was like a five month course. And, you know, it back then, I mean, that was 80, 88 at that point. And that was, I can't remember how much I paid for that. It was like 4,500 bucks. And that was a lot of money to throw down. Is you know. this the thing where you're working at the, tell me this story, like you're working at the makeup counter at this place and you sold more in a day than your boss had sold all month. Cause you would come in with the makeup and everyone's like, right. I want that. Like, that's so smart. Well, that, yeah. That was, that was a fun idea or just a fun moment. Cause when I first, I, I had a move, I moved out at one point because it was a friend of my aunt's who said, I can get you in the industry. And basically what they meant was I can get you. And like, I, I ended up just losing all my money and oh. had to move back home to Wisconsin for a short bit. Oh. And I just wasn't deterred. And it's like, eh, I'm going to turn around and come back. So I was home wow. for, you know, like maybe five months or so. And then I turned around and came back and just, you know, was like, nope, I've got to do this. So, um, no, and that's I, when I was, when I moved out the first time, I got this job at a, at a local uh, costume shop. It was, uh, it was called okay. Confetti oh. with costumes and party goods. And it was over in Agora Hills. Um, just up the 101 freeway here. And uh, so, yeah, I worked there and they had this beautiful makeup counter with all the old, the Ben Nye line of makeups and latex rubber and crepe hair and stuff. And I was like, that was heaven to me because, you know, I, I searched and scrounged, you know, I could get like these little makeup sticks at our local little mm. you know store. Like we had a, it was a weird little head shop in uh, Wisconsin where they had like novelties is almost like a spencer's gift so oh, okay like novelties but they had all the old don post rubber masks and i would go in every day and say oh can i try on that one can i try it you know but then i, I go to this this uh, store in agora hills they give me a job and i'm just like pricing and marking things and doing this stuff and getting ready for halloween and the the owner of the shop had no idea that i was aspiring to be a makeup artist and work oh, in film okay so we got discounts and all this kind of stuff so i like grabbed all this makeup crap, put it in my kit and came in the next day, like on a Saturday, it's going to be a big day. Everybody wear a costume, you know, pick a costume off the shelf, do that. And I did this makeup full bald cap, crepe hair, beard, wrinkles and all this stuff and came in with the cane and all that. She like stopped me. I came through the front door and she goes, Oh, sorry, <laughs> sir. We're not open for another half an hour. Go, hey, it's, it's me. It's Ted. Like, wow. What? How did you, what the, how, who did that? I said, no, I did that. Where did you get all that stuff from? I said, your makeup comic. <laughs> I said, you've got all this stuff. And she goes, oh my God, I had no idea. And so she do something tomorrow as well. And I came in like a full wolf man and, and stuff like that. And, uh, wow. Uh, so that, that went on for that whole month. So that I was, was definitely it. a sign that you're probably pretty good at this. If you fooled your boss with the makeup. Yeah. And that was just cotton and latex type stuff and mortician's wax and, you know, getting up at 3 a.m. and doing like a four hour makeup on myself and yeah, all that kind of stuff. So then how did you get, was the first job you had the Seed People movie or did you have commercials or TV shows before that? No, I think I, uh, The Lawnmower Man. Oh. Stephen King's The Lawnmower That's Man. a cool movie. My first, my first professional gig out here. I had gotten hired at uh, John Beekler's shop at MMI. How did you get and that? Yeah. How'd you get that job? How did you get so from that was right out of that? Right. was right out of that school, the Institute. Oh. So I had gone to that and I was like really disappointed in what they were teaching there. You know, it was like, it just wasn't that advanced. There was a couple hmm. other guys that were just kind of going, twiddling their thumbs going, I, I know all of the stuff that you're showing me, but we hmm. couldn't. And I was young and really, you know, 
it's like, I want to quit this school. And the instructor was like, nope, you can't quit. I've got all your money, so you can't quit. And it's like, give me a refund. Nope. Like, uh, and just, but I mean, the thing I always say, I paid $4,500 to get my first job. Well, there you go. That works. One day, one day out of school, the instructor gave me a call and said, Hey, I just got a call from John Beekler. Go do an interview with him. And so I went to John Beekler's and he gave me a job on the spot. And that was for Lawnmower Man. And then that, that went straight into Seed People and all these other full moon films of Seed People and, uh, was it uh, Netherworld and uh, Dollman versus Demonic Toys? Uh, you know, it's just all of that kind of goofy, schlocky stuff. And right. Yeah. So was this the guy? So this is the guy that you were working with. Tell tell my audience this story. I heard you talking about this. Yeah. Where there's two of you. You had the. You both had the same. I think it was Ted and Tim, and they were going to yeah. fire one of you. You had a fifty fifty chance of just being fired for having the wrong name. I, I remembered it being Tim and. A buddy of mine recently was going, no, no, no. His name was Ted as well. Oh, okay. Well, couldn't one so, of you be yeah. Theodore or get a nickname? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Either either way, John couldn't figure out our names anyhow. It was, I think it was Ted and Tim. and uh, But he called me Tim and he called the other guy Ted. And then he wanted to get rid of you. He goes, yeah, yeah. Get rid of that Ted guy because he's useless. And the fellow I was working with, Mike Deke, who was heading up that shop, he goes, wait a minute which guy are you talking about he said you know the shorter dude with the blah 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 he goes that's tim get him out of here uh, we gotta keep ted <laughs> right yeah because so is, yeah yeah i mean you were working really i heard you say that i mean there was nights where you would like almost like sleep in the shop and sleep two or three oh, yeah. hours and then wake up and, and a lot of yeah a lot of guys did i mean the john beekler's shop was like a 24 7 shop you know we start i think i started out at 250 dollars a week flat for John. And, uh, yeah, you would just, you would get in there in the morning. Usually it was like nine o'clock. We'd roll in, start working, but none of us left there until nine, 10 o'clock at night. And there were so many times where we just, we just went all night long. You know, a few guys would go home and shower. We'd get something to eat this or that, come back to the shop, sleep on the table, get some fernie pads and pull them over us for a few hours. And, we did a lot, but we were also like 20, 21, 22 years old. And it's kind of like, mm. and you loved it. Right. I mean, cause you're working yeah. on movie stuff. This is so cool. This is your dream for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you look around and it's like molds everywhere and mon- you know, stuff like this monsters everywhere. And it's like, what, what else have I got to do? It's like, at the time, it's like, I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a kid. I wasn't married. I didn't have, you know, I just had this little room. I was renting out in thousand Oaks and it was just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, just making monsters and all you're sculpting and doing stuff and it's like oh shit it's two o'clock in the morning <laughs> well i'll just stay <laughs> wow but you're not into so you're not really living the party lifestyle in your 20s you're okay. not going out you're this is your this is your fun kind of that was that was partying for me <laughs> <laughs> staying, in, staying in the shop i mean occasionally we would somebody would go get a case of beer and we'd all have a beer sitting next to us on our table more times than not, it was like jolt cola or something like that. <laughs> to stay awake, you know, we to stay awake yeah. No dose, no dose and jolt cola. But, you know, when you're 21 years old, it's just kind of like you're amped up anyhow and you're making crazy stuff. And Yeah. So, so then the Wyatt Earp, that was a significant yeah. one because you got to work with a, how do you say his last name? Is it Berger or Howard? Ber- Berger. Berger. Ber- Howard Berger. Okay. And, and t- yeah. explain to my audience who he is. I'm just learning about all the amazing resume that he has. Oh yeah. No. It, and it, that was at the time it's, and it still is, it's KNB effects group. Okay. And that was uh, Kurtzman, Nicotero and Berger. So that's, you know, Greg Nicotero from walking dead fame. And then you've got Howard Berger from, Oh my God, you know, multiple Oscar winner now and, you know, Narnia and uh, uh, Hitchcock and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, they were a relatively small shop still at the time. Hmm. And I was working at alchemy effects for Mike Deke on these full moon films. And Howard Berger called over and said, hey, do you got anybody over there that can do some foam fabrication? And this guy. And I was the only one in the shop, too. But I was doing some foam stuff of my own. And, you know, Mike Deke said, yeah, I'm going to send Ted over. And Howard was like, I, I only need somebody for like two weeks. So if, he, if he's OK with two weeks. And so I went over for two weeks. And about five years later, I moved on to a different shop. <laughs> wow. So yeah, then so I hung around there for a while. Then in 94, you did, uh, you worked on Pulp Fiction. Now tell, what yeah. is it, what was your role in that? Cause it said, I think it said makeup effects. And I, I know that movie front to back. So which scenes yeah. include your work? 
so there's um there's a scene let's see what was it because we did a bunch of stuff for that basically it's the uh, the fella and i can't remember his name uh who gets shot in the back seat when oh John Travolta turns around he's yeah. talking to him and he's got his gun and they go hit a bump and marvin marvin there you go i think is it a, marvin's it, head blows up yeah i can't remember the actor's yeah. name I'm, it, it's, no it's yeah, not orlando jones on, it's somebody no because it was a, the the guy he was in um uh mad tv yeah like it's the other guy doctor. from mad tv yeah but anyway yeah. so that because that so was pretty graphic worked on that and helping like you know do that so of course there was a different there was a guy who sculpted that and the mold makers and the painters so i worked on some of the gut stuff inside and whatever but then how do they do that with, with the with the with the brain blowing up how, it, that was a that was an air mortar so like in the back seat of this car you've got a tank and um it's hooked up to a a, a solenoid which will just expel all of that air at once okay you know, so instead of like a slow hiss like you would hear from any kind of air tank yeah it's it's got a direct connection to this solenoid and it just opens it up and just goes bam you know so that's you've got the tank sitting in the back seat you've got this tube that goes up that's loaded with like brains you know <laughs> just rubber rubber nernies and all kinds of crap and guts and fake stuff and blood and then you put the cap of that head on you know and there's multiple pieces and it kind of got pinned in and at a certain point, it just like click, you hit a button and that just explodes. And, and then, then they splice like him, the live person with when it switches to the fake head. Like if you paused it, could you see that it's a fake you head? I, I'll, I'll be honest. I haven't seen it in a long time, but yeah. I'm not sure. I think that was just like an editing trick. I don't think it was okay. digital use there. So I think, you know, you're, you're cutting back and forth. You, Travolta, Marvin, Travolta, Marvin. Mm -hmm. And then the gun goes off from the point of view of Marvin. And you quickly do a cut to the back, the back seat, and it's already the fake head, and that's just exploding. Wow! You know, that's that's just so you know you you're seeing the real guy talk and blah blah yeah. blah, and then wham! So do you get brain, to be on set for that, or is this something you worked on? I wasn't, on, the... on, I wasn't wow. on set for that one. I wasn't on set, but I, then I built his body as well. There's a scene, yeah, where they're carrying the body through the yeah. house, and then you also see it going into the trunk. But yeah, I worked when I first got hired at KMB, and that was for Wyatt Earp for the Kevin Costner film Wyatt Earp, and that was just simply to build a uh, a dead deer that gets draped over the back of Costner's horse. Oh, you know, it, it's it's right after the buffalo. Um, oh no, it's not after that. I think it's a, he's younger and he's riding into town or whatever, and there's just this dead white-tailed deer that he's been out hunting, mm. and they needed that that done. They had already done all the buffaloes and everything like that for the that scene and. Howard just wanted me for helping out to build a dead deer. And then that turned into in the mouth of madness and which turned into from dust till dawn. And then just, you know, and K and B just kind of exploded because they went from like a, I don't know, maybe like a 4,000 square foot shop to like a 15,000 square shop or, you know, 12,000 square feet and, you know, dust till dawn just exploded that. And then so many other films and TV shows that we were just constantly working. Right. Yeah. So from dusk till dawn, did you do the vampire effects on that one? Or what was the, what was your role? I in that? did a bunch of, there, there was a, a, a goofy vampire creature that Bob Kurtzman had designed. And it's this big kind of woolly, hairy creature that you only basically see it skitter through the background once. Uh, okay. <laughs> that was it. But then I helped, you know, do a lot of the, um, the rigid polyfoam dummies that are all kind of standing around when they, you see the characters run up. And then they do this turn because the lights all coming in and then they blow up. Yeah. So they were, they, we would do like this match cut type thing where it was like the rigid dummy that was all rigged with blood bags and Primacord and all that stuff that the, the VFX, you know, the uh, pyrotechnic guys would, would rig those to blow. And then, so we had the guys in the suits, they would run up, do their reaction and we do a smash cut to, you know, the dummy in the same position, just like, Damn. Oh, so you were on set for that one then if you're if you're i was on set a couple of times for that yeah but mostly still in the shop because yeah. you had a huge crew that was on set doing makeup and puppeteering and we were building at the same time so i'm building creatures casting things just doing all kinds of gooey effects and things like that in the shop so what do you like better being in the shop or being on set or both oh boy you know it, it being in the shop is really fun when you're figuring out gags to do on set you know that's mm -hmm. really fun and usually if you come up with a very specific gag you get to take that on set 
And so that's really rewarding. You actually get to be there with like whatever, like, you know, plungers for blood and goo and guts and, or just be able to see this thing really work. I mean, set work can get crazy tiring, especially like way back in the day when I worked on full moon and empire pictures, my God, you could do 16, 18, 22 hour days. Yeah. Wasn't there one time where you had to wear this suit for like 16 hours or something? It was like the longest. Yeah. There was a film called, uh, Frankenstein and me. Yeah. And it's, it's on Disney channel, like every year. Um, I think it still is, but I did. And that was like one of the first films I did the effects for. And, uh, so I built a, a wolf man, a Frankenstein, a mummy. I think it was all of those. So I got to do all the classic characters, which, you know, it was a great kids film. And, uh, I played Frankenstein's monster. I played the mummy and I was in that mummy costume for about 16 hours or so. Just is that looking safe? Out of is that, is that, can you die from could, that? No, I could breathe. You know, it's okay. like it was a foam latex head, foam latex hands, and the rest was all, you know, fabric. You can't die from foam. getting too hot though, or too like heat exhaustion or something. Well, you could, but I mean, we were on stage okay. and you know, I had the back of the suit was opened up and I could get oh, that's air good. and, okay. you know, and it, it was all glued down around my mouth so I could breathe fine. Okay. I could eat and I could drink and, you know, just the only big deal was like looking out of that pinhole for 16 hours. That yeah. was pretty crazy. And then this is cool. You gave the co- the Frankenstein costume to Ryan Gosling. Yeah. That's no, kind of a Ryan, cool story. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the kids that were in that film were all great, you know, but they were like, probably all around like 13 years old, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think I was only like around 25 when we did that film. Mm. So, you know, those numbers, as you get older, get closer, you know, (laughs) because now I'm in my fifties and Ryan Gosling's, you know, it's like, everybody's catching up. They're all adults and they're amazing actors and all that kind of stuff. But no, Ryan was, I just remember him, the kids were all great and they were all kind of like taking interest in what I was doing. But Ryan in, in particular was like very like scrutinizing, like, how'd you do that? You know, poking at it and doing all this kind of stuff. And we wrapped the film because uh, we shot most of it here out in Victorville at a dry lake bed and all that kind of stuff in, outside of Victorville. And then we went to uh, Montreal to finish the film. And then we were wrapped and done. And I was wrapping up all my stuff when I had the Frankenstein costume left over. And Ryan was like, is there anything I could have? And it's like, there you go. You want the Frank Slane costume? Is that what usually happens? Can you just, does it just get past or anybody can take it? Or do I, people do I have? Probably sh- no, I no? Mean, that stuff, especially more these days. Oh. Absolutely not. Okay. I mean, like when I, I used to work for legacy effects and, you know, we did all of the, the Iron Man films and all that kind of stuff. That stuff is boxed up, crated up. It's like Raiders Lost Ark where they're pushing it down a hallway and into another hallway. It's, it's stored. It's huh. stored and secured. And if, uh, if Marvel doesn't take it, than legacy or whomever K and B or, or, you know, spectrum motion, whomever that's all stored, you know, somebody keeps it, it gets stored. And then later on, if the, if the studio determines it, it might get auctioned or sold. And a lot of times way back and, you know, not even way, way back, but they used to just put it in the dumpster, went to the dump. Oh, that's terrible. You know, there's so much stuff that's, I, I heard a story from an old friend of my, uh, Shannon Shea that, um, this was back at Stan Winston's studio at 20th Century Fox. They got a call from somebody one day and they said, hey, uh, you guys did all that stuff for Predator, right? And they go, yeah. And they go, uh, we've got it all in storage here, but we want to get rid of it because we got to make room for new stuff. And they said, okay, yeah. They said, no, 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 you got to come now. We're, we've got a dumpster pulled up and we're going to start throwing it. And it was like molds and props what? and original suits and animatronic heads and Apparently, like all of these guys jumped in their trucks, raced the Fox, and were just pulling molds and out of the dumpster. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is worth, you could on eBay. I, I can't but imagine. People, people didn't even think of that stuff back then. I mean, it was yeah. just, it's stuff that took up space. Huh. Because, I mean, what, what you build this stuff for primarily is for that moment on film. And then it's gone. You don't need it anymore. So, mm-hmm. you know, you... You hear so much stuff like I remember hearing on 2001 A Space Odyssey when that film was done, all those molds just got, you know, all the molds and models not done, just dumpster. Yeah, I you think know, the original the, original Star Wars, Millennium Falcon, uh, X-Wings, all that stuff yeah. just dumpster. No, I know. Like Return of the Jedi, the, the, the skiff at the beginning, uh, they they 
they blew it up and then they uh, used the they gave the wood to people. So people in Yuma, Arizona, they have roofs and the roof is like part of like Return of the Jedi. I mean, that's so weird oh, to me. Only, yeah. If only I lived in Yuma. I know, right? So another one you worked on. Uh, what did, what was your role in this one? Scream, because that's one of my favorite horror movies. We just rewatched it last night because I was like, I remember I used to have the laser disc. And that had 30 seconds of extra footage where it was much more gory. 30 seconds. Yeah, but it's like, it's a <laughs> lot. I mean, because it's like those one or two seconds that they had to cut out because it would be yeah. like, I remember the guys, he's in the uh, uh, chair and his guts are spilling out in the laser. That, that's your part? That's me. Oh, that was crazy. <laughs> no, that was, I, I, I always get to, that's my, I, my claim to fame on Scream is that the two first people killed in Scream, I killed them. <laughs> so the, the the guy in the chair is, yeah he's sitting he's on his knees sort of behind the chair but leaning forward so i made this whole false body and he's out there and he's just all gutted so i did this cavity with all these guts in it and stuff and blood pumping through and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So i did that gag and then you know built the false body like the uh the legs and all that stuff are all fake and he's just kneeling behind the chair leaning in and then i built the body for uh, Drew Barrymore. Okay. Who you Which see, is I think, hanging. hanging in the tree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, and that was again at KMB. So, you know, Drew Barrymore had come in. We did all of her measurements. Um, the life casting crew did her life cast. That was re-sculpted to replicate her head. And my, it, it was funny. So many things at KMB that I was responsible for was like the neck down. Because I did all these bodies sculpted out of foam. It was it was quicker and cheaper for me to get a giant block of upholstery foam and quickly whittle that down. So I could probably do that in like a day or two. And then, you know, I'd put an armature in it and all that kind of stuff. But otherwise, you'd have to do a full body cast and molds and all this sort of stuff. Mm. And I just do measurements, you know, trace a person out, measure. Same thing I did for, um, uh, what was it? The Green Mile. So I did. Michael oh, you Clark worked on Duncan's that one too. Body. Yeah, that was at KMB as well. So Michael Clark Duncan's body, Michael Jeter's body from that, um, Graham Greene's body. Again, neck down. That was always me just sculpting somebody's body from the neck down. <laughs> so you didn't work on the, the head that got squished and screamed. That was someone else? No, that was somebody else. Okay. Film. But I mean, that was all KMB. Um, and then there's all probably, you know, tons of little gags that I can't even remember from that film that were just probably thrown at me and said, Hey, you know, somebody's going to get this limb chopped off or this thing or something. And sometimes we'd rig fake knives with blood going through them or, you know, I'd have to rewatch the film and go, Oh yeah, I did work. On yeah. There's so films I worked on. I can't even remember, you know? So what do you use for the guts and the blood? Like, is there certain like go-tos? Like if you're having, cause those intestines, I mean, it looked like in the laser disc again, it makes me mad that they cut it out. Cause in the laser discs, I think they actually spill out. But I think in the regular, yeah. they cut it a little bit. Does that bother you too, by the way, that they cut out some of the stuff that you... Well, it used to when I was younger. It's like, oh, geez, my thing that I worked on. Yeah. Like, and then as I got older, it's like, well, check cleared. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, I yeah. Got to, I got to pay my mortgage this month. Yeah, that's so, nice. You know, and I got, I'll, I'll use the picture for my portfolio so I can get the next job. Oh, that's true, so, yeah. It, I mean, it's it's fun, but the more, you know, and I started out making amateur films, so I understand editing too. But if you left my thing in there, it could be a little bit too gratuitous, not because it's too gross, but it's just like you went a little bit too far with it and you didn't need to see that, you know. So I understand how they will take a scene and they'll trim it by that mm. much or that, you know. Yeah. And it's like, no, nope, but just needed this little extra, you know, or, or, or taken away that is, you know, like yeah. leave the imagination of the audience going oh, like, you know, cause your imagination is a lot better than what anything we can make typically. You know, you can do to visualize, you know, what's going to happen to this person or what's happening versus, you know, I don't, somebody, yeah. Cause sometimes somebody scream off camera. It's like you, yeah. like in glorious bastards, when you see, oh. uh, um, uh, you, you see Brad Pitt coming in with a knife and you just hear the screaming and you could just like, Oh God, what's he doing? Yeah. You know, it, it's just cringing. Everybody's gotten a cut. Everybody's bled. Everybody, you know, like that. But you're just like, oh, shit, what's he doing? Right. Like, that. and then when you finally see it at the end of the film, it's it's still kind of like, ugh. But when you show it, like, just really daylight out in the front, sometimes it just, it, it, to, for me, it doesn't have the impact of it being slightly, you know, it's the old thing of Spielberg with, like, you know, if the shark really worked really well, what kind of film would Jaws have been? 
You know, yeah, it's like, true. would it, would it have been as suspenseful? Would it have been, you know, or would we have gotten a lot more rubber shark? True. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely some scenes like when the leg drops and stuff. I mean, I yeah. remember seeing that as a kid. I mean, that looks like a real leg. You're like, yikes. Yeah. So no, and when it starts to drop and then they cut just at the right moment where it's like, you're, you don't linger on it too long. You don't. And that's, yeah. that's the thing with the trick with us where it's like, you don't always want to show it for like too long. Cause you give away the magic trick. Mm. That's what I'm saying with like, if you pause some of this stuff, could you really notice but like, oh, so yeah, oh, yeah. So going back to the, the kid, the kid who's gut spell, what do you use for the, the guts? Oh the, yeah. Cause it looks so, I mean, real. I mean, it freaks you out. It, it latex rubber. I mean, it, it's most everything. I mean, these days there's, there's better things or silicone and all that kind of stuff that will build hearts and livers and intestines, all that out of silicone. But back in the day, we would use just regular latex rubber, the kind that they make masks out of like Halloween okay. masks. Sometimes I really like to use um, foam base. So there's foam latex. And foam base is like really pure latex without a lot of the fillers and things like that. And when it dries, it has a very um, kind of a translucent, more clear appearance to it. And I love doing just like little bits of tint to that. And it makes great intestines and, and veins and all that kind of stuff. So, and then when you slather in some fake blood, you know, caro syrup and food coloring, it's just, yeah, it's so disgusting. How do, what do you, do you use something as a model to make like if you're making guts, for example, like do you look at a video or pictures of like real guts and then try to copy that? Or do you just kind of go creative and just go, oh, we, this is. No, we haven't. I mean, it, it's it's 50 50. I mean, there's times where it's like we really have to study. And I'll tell you, I mean, I, I've seen some of these anatomy books and forensic books with like real severed heads and real autopsy stuff. And you would be shocked how fake it looks. Really? Because when when a body is dead it loses its color. It loses that, that pinky punch that makes it look like a human. So when we're doing things for a film, we're doing things that look real, you know, so you can see all the, the okay. textures and, and, the, and the coloration because that's what we think, you know, people look like. So we actually almost enhance it. Interesting. If you were to actually see like a severed limb or anything like that, the color leaves so quickly and the blood dries so dark. It's not this glossy red. It's not, oh. you know, like that. And and just if you were to see a real thing, which I have in these books, where it's like, it just doesn't look real. There's something sort of <laughs> that fake. is so funny. Yeah, it, it's strange. So I mean, what we do with like real parts and makeup, we enhance it so that the audience who thinks they know what this should look like goes, oh yeah, that's what a severed head looks like. That's what a severed arm looks like. That's what a horrible gash in somebody's you know chest looks like and typically it's not that at all it's not it's usually not quite as gross as you would think it was or it's well, not bleeding as much yeah because or... I, I wondered about that because even like watching scream last night i was looking at the blood and it's so red i'm like i don't think blood is really that red it's almost like cheer, like bright red i'm like i'm think, pretty sure most blood's dark red isn't it and i mean it's, that's that's often like your director or your dp saying you know we don't see it we need to see it more. We need oh. to, it needs to pop a little bit more. Yeah. Cause if you were to just totally duplicate what blood looks like, it gets dark really quick as soon as it comes out of your body. Mm -hmm. And you know, cause the oxygen hits it and it changes really quick. Yeah. It turns like and brown course, if it's on a shirt or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, so we're always trying to make it more real than real so that the audience, you know, go, Ugh! You know? Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. So you work yeah. you you work on these sets with a, a lot of big stars. I, th I thought this was interesting. You were talking about working on Evolution with uh, Julianne Moore, and you had to like your yeah. job was to calm her down a little bit. She had to put on a suit. It was it wasn't my job. I was just simply yeah. <laughs> you were asked to do it. Yeah, somebody you're doing so them a we, favor. Yeah, we had built some really cool um, plant type organic not creatures, but at Steve Johnson's shop at uh, uh, um, Edge Effects. And so I was there just puppeteering those and maintaining those. And somebody who knew that I had done like some creature costume work, or at least I'd put people in suits at that time. They said, you've done this a bunch, haven't you? Like inside. And they said, Julian's having a bit of trouble because she's in this full hazmat suit. And they said, would you come and talk to her for a second? I was like, yeah, sure. It's like, well, I don't know. And so I just went over and, you know, talked to her and she kind of like, held on to my hand for a second 
And I said, yeah, I've been in this stuff before. And I said, you know, I really kind of like it. And I told her about how you just kind of get into the Zen of it, you know, and just kind of like that. And she said, how do you, how do you sometimes work past the, uh, a little bit, you know, if you get a little anxiety in you or something yeah. like that, how do you work past it? I said, you just close your eyes and you breathe and you think of the residual checks that will come later. <laughs> <laughs> and then she started laughing. She goes, oh my God, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Did you ever get intimidated? Cause you also like, you helped put Arnold, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger suit on and all these yeah. big stars Is that, are you just, that's just kind of part of the business at this point. You know, it's, it's part of the business. I mean, it's always really fun to meet people, especially for the first time, you know, there's some people you work with a couple of times or whatever, but I was very nervous about going to work with Arnold on Jingle All the Way. And, you know, when we first did a suit up of him, uh, of the Turbo Man costume, we went to Minneapolis and they were shooting at the Mall of America. And so myself and Bob Kurtzman from KMB, we flew there, we had Arnold's suit and Arnold had been shooting in the mall all day long. So he was sweaty and hot and he just, they'd been, kids had been chasing him and Sinbad had been chasing him and so he comes in and I was like, oh, I'm going to meet Arnold. I'm going to meet Arnold. This is really exciting. And he comes in and I'm like, oh man, he just is tired. He is just done with this day. And somebody said, oh wait, Arnold, before you get, remember, we're going to do the fitting with it. And he was just like, <laughs> you know, it was like, so it's like, and he was super nice. He was super great. That entire shoot, you know, just really great guy. Yeah. Didn't your and, parents uh, get to come meet him and stuff? Yeah. They came on set. That's they cool. Met Sinbad, they met Arnold and he was super nice dude, but. Yeah, it's like meeting these guys, but then I hang out with them for like two and a half months, you know, two months with Arnold. And uh, it's just, you know, you're hanging outside of his trailer and he's like telling you stories. Oh, okay, let's get suited up. And, you know, you you quickly realize, and of course it's true with everybody. It's like they they all sit on the toilet. They all put their pants on sure. one leg at a time. Some people are just a lot richer than other people. <laughs> You know, and it's, it's fine. And, you know, some actors you meet that they know that and they can hang that over you. I have mm. met very, very few bad apples, you know? Oh, that's um, good. I've worked with some huge names and I'd say 99 and nine tenths percent really great people. Well, really yeah. Great people. So like you work on some big movies, Avatar, Iron yeah. Man, Hunger Games. Um, I think I you heard you say you also worked on the Infinity Wars Avengers and you put the suit on Robert Downey Jr. For Endgame. Yeah. For Endgame. I'm sorry. That that's was, what... I And that was the thing. On, uh, yeah, so I, I, I got to work a lot in the shops on a lot of those films on Thor and on uh, Winter Soldier, you know, stuff like that. And I was always in the shop. So we always had other crews because they would be in Atlanta. They would be, did they go to England one time? But they were in different places, different locations. And, uh, and usually my job was just so integral to building that I had to stay in the shop. You yeah. know, you've got specific people that go on set and suit people up. And, but if you're working on big projects, it's like in the shop is where they want to keep you. Cause you know, especially when I'm doing something that's really specialized, the foam fabrication stuff, there's not a lot of people that could replace what I was doing. So I just have to be there. Mm. But yeah, on Endgame, they let me go to set for one week and it was reshoots. So nobody had been in their costumes or anything for at least a year. And they oh. came back for Endgame and did a couple of neat little shots. And yeah, I stood there along with uh, um, some coworkers, uh, Tracy and Vicky, and we were standing there with the Iron Man torsos. You know, he, he wore the shoulders down to about up to the elbows and then the whole torso with a bit of the rib cage on it. And then, you know, he's got all the, the mocap pajamas on. And uh, so I was standing there with it, holding it. And he's okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And he looks over at me and he goes, am I wearing that? And I said, only if you want to. And he goes, well, it's the last time. Let's do oh. it <laughs> like that. And so he just put his arms out like this and I put the suit around him and uh, Vicky and Tracy, you know, we were zipping up the back and clicking on the things. And I said, one last thing. And I flipped on his, his RT light and, you know, he went, I was standing right behind a green screen and he walked around the other side, knelt down and did the whole, you know, I am Iron Man, you know, the, the, the big snap. So you and built his it. Iron Man suit is what you're saying. I worked on that. Yeah. You worked on not, it. Yeah. I'm certainly not the only person. I mean, that was at legacy. And so you, how had, many people does it take to build that? dozens upon dozens i really? mean like you've got 
it starts out with like the digital. So you've got like the Marvel people who are designing, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the costume. And then, you know, the 3d modeling then happened at probably at different levels at Marvel and then at legacy as well. So you've got 3d modelers who are working in the computer and then building that on top of a scan of Robert Downey. Okay. And then, uh, then all those pieces get printed out. They get sanded and model shop, model shopped and finished molded cast paint department uh fabrication department which is where i worked and you know we would connect these pieces to an undersuit and make that workable you know sometimes it's a hard suit sometimes it's a soft suit depends on what has to happen in any particular scene or Hmm. um so it, it it travels through all of the departments and there's tons of hands touching it and you know wow electronics you know you got to make the thing light up right you know it's a big deal so yeah it's a huge deal what do you like better the the big blockbusters obviously i'm assuming that those pay more but is it it's also more stressful is is it more fun to do the indie movies or it it only pays more to the people that own the shop so really if you if you make x amount of dollars you make x amount of dollars you know huh and so okay. it's like, that's my, that's my job. I okay. work in the fabrication department and this is how much I make, you know, per hour. And, and so it's like, if the shop I'm working for, no matter what shop in town is working on some little indie film that someone goes, uh, my budget for this is only 20 grand guys. Can you help me out with this? And they go, yeah, we can do something. We'll, we'll get, we'll throw something together in a week or two. Or, you know, you do a big Marvel film and it's like, eh, sorry guys, we only got a million and a half dollars. Can you do that? You know? So, you know, and that's that that changes for the the, the companies you work for. Mm-hmm. You know, they either make more or make less. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the artist and everybody else, you're just making the same amount of money all the time. Hmm. So would you ever want to direct your own movie? Oh, I don't know. At this point, I don't <laughs> I mean, maybe 20 years ago. But, yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I used to fool around when I was a kid. doing yeah. films, and I would love to direct something. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. You know, I, I used to write scripts and write stories and there's little shorts and things like that, that I would love to be able to, to direct. But at this point now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm out on my own and I've got a lot of jobs that I'm working on right now. And, uh, you know, so it's basically keeping those jobs coming in and, uh, you know, so you're not, that money side. you're not affiliated <laughs> with any shop, right? Currently you're, you're just like no. a freelance. Is that what you call it? Or yeah, I'm a freelance. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm getting called in and I work with my wife as well, who just, she used to work at legacy effects as well. So that's right. She, she does makeup, it. I think, right. She does costumes. And costumes. So oh, she, yeah. She's more of a, um, a costume builder, you know, like fine tailoring type, like costume building. And, uh, yeah, we both worked on the Mandalorian TV show there. And oh, I love that she, one. She was responsible. My wife, Ilona, was responsible for building the uh, the armorer's costume. Oh, wow. So, that's huge. Yeah. So uh, it, with the exception of the helmet and the breastplate, because that was the model shop and mold shop and paint shop and all that kind of stuff, they did those hard pieces. Mm-hmm. But then all of the tailoring, that was all my wife that did that. So. Have you watched that show? It's so good. Oh yeah. No, I've yeah. we watch it. Yeah. We sit there because she were I left Legacy after that first season. So she worked on season two and got to work on the uh Banthas and a couple oh, other things like that. That's really and, cool. Because that's yeah, your dream is to do Star Wars. But that's kind of I mean it's in the Star oh, Wars yeah. universe. Yeah. And I mean that that was yeah, being able to work on a Star Wars film and touch it. I got to go on set for two days. Um, really before they started shooting, we were still working on the costume. So we went to kind of figure out a couple more things and set up on set. So, um, so I didn't get to get really far into that world. It would have been fun to Uh, be in that world, but I was there in the shop. I get, I get to point at it at an action figure and go, see that thing right there. I built that. You know? That's neat. What other movies and, uh, uh, or TV shows or commercials? I know you did a lot of commercials too. Anything else that stands out to you as a highlight? As a highlight. I mean, or a like, low light, just because... memorable. Something that's really stands out to you that, Oh gosh, this one was either really good or really bad. <laughs> well, there, I mean, there are certain jobs that are just tougher than others that, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be the schedule or, you know, what, what we do, the materials we use are pretty much the same almost on every show, but it's a matter of how we use them. 
you know, it's like, we're doing this thing and it's like, okay, we figure out how to do this. Now the next show is like, oh no, no, now we got to take it and twist it. And now it's got to turn into this. So mm. you have to use the materials that are in front of you to constantly create something new and different without making it look like the last thing. But I mean, I really enjoyed doing the commercials when I was at Legacy because they were quick. They were fast turnaround. You didn't get stuck on like one thing for three or four months. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, we would work on like the the Geico pig, the little piggy that was like, wee out the window, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, I remember that one. So many little monsters and creatures and all this kind of stuff for um, just different ad campaigns. And they usually was quick turnarounds. Like we need these in anywhere from four weeks to one week, you know, and it just oh. had to be quick. And so it's like bashing together muscle suits, these giant creature suits and guys downstairs sculpting heads. And I'm upstairs doing a muscle suit and doing the hair on it. Mold shop is feverishly, you know, fiberglass and rubber. And, you know, that stuff was pretty fun. And then more times than not, I got to take that stuff to set, you know, mm. when it would shoot for a commercial. And that was really a lot of fun because you're only on set for like two days, three days tops with any of these creatures and costumes. You get back in the shop. And usually I knew exactly what I was going to the next, as soon as I got back in the shop. It's like, don't forget, now we've got this commercial for Chef Boy RD coming up, you know, so as soon as you get back, that's what you're doing. It's like, okay, and you do that for a few weeks and that goes to set. And it's like, don't forget when you got to work on, you know, uh, the Kia hamsters are, you know, we're doing that campaign again. So as soon as you get back on Monday, go to storage, get all the old Kia hamsters out. We got to refurbish those or rebuild some or yeah. So you guys yeah. turn that over. I, I heard you, this was interesting. Cause like, I know I'm a big fan of Halloween. I don't know if you're not Halloween. I would assume that you are, oh, but like, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. We go to like these costume contests and we always had, we, we would always have these great costumes. And then we'd see these people that were dressed up as transformers. And we're like, okay, we're not going to beat these. <laughs> but it was interesting to hear you talk about how they, one of the cosplay guys tried to get one of these gigs to build a transformer, but it was yeah. like, Oh, it's going to take me six months. And you're like, well, we can do it in three weeks. Cause you guys have well, a whole team, right? Well, that's the thing is like, we've got a team and, you know, and that, that's the thing when sometimes we, you know, some of the projects I'm working on right now, it takes a long time because it is just myself or myself and my wife, or we'll bring on a couple extra people here and there. But, um, it, you know, when you're doing cosplay type work, these people will spend like a year on one costume. And that's because that's not their job too. They've got like a nine to five job. And then they get to work on their cosplay thing, like on the weekends or in the evenings, whenever they, they can afford to work on it. But, you know, for us in the shops, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, we've got 10 people we can throw at this. Let's just start cutting foam. And, you know, another department is, you know, they're they're sculpting the head and we're doing the body and somebody else's electronics are coming in. And so we're all on top of each other, building this stuff at the same time. Whereas if I'm doing it by myself, it's like, I have to sculpt it. I have to mold it. Right. I have to cast it. I have to, that takes a long time to do, you know, but if you've got all these different departments that are just can heap on at once, you can do this stuff in two weeks. But didn't you say the industry's changed in that regard too? Like it's, it's, it's more rushed. You used to have more time, but now they want it faster. And so you guys are having yeah. to do that. And you said 3d printing has helped, but it's still, that's got to be a lot harder to do, to have less time. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's the, the 3D printing definitely helps to a certain extent, but there's some times where it's like, well, we can do it faster, you know, because we've got good, talented sculptors that can just mm -hmm. sculpt something really mm -hmm. quick. And, um, you know, sometimes the 3D, well, I've got a couple of 3D printers just sitting on the other side of the camera here. And, you know, something just came off my printer the other day for, or this morning for a job that we're working on. It was a 16 hour print. Oh wow! So it was like you know, there's times and it, and it's fine because I didn't need it immediately. Mm -hmm. It coincides with another piece that we need, and then that's just going to go over. My wife is doing the sculpting on that, and uh, so she has to do some other model shopping, sculpting pieces on that. But if I had needed that now, then I would have sat down with some bondo and some fiberglass, and I would have just made it. You know, but now it's like, I can also repeat this too. If I need another one, I can print it. I can print that one. But there's times where we've printed like these big heads for creatures and things like that, where sometimes you don't have enough time to do that mm. because milling, milling out that foam, having somebody 3D model that, that could take upwards to a week. Whereas a good sculptor with a bunch of bags of wed clay, 
can slap some clay on and do a really nice sculpture in two days. And then that goes to the mold department. Hmm. You know, it, it, it all depends on how quickly it has to happen. You know, 3D, you know, modeling and, and all that kind of stuff really has its place. You know, for you, know, you went, you would barely have an Iron Man suit without it. Hmm. You, we obviously could sculpt that because that's what was done in the past. You would sculpt that with Siobhan. It's almost like, you know, they used to sculpt cars that way you know, with clay. Right. And uh, so that's the way it used to be done. There's certainly fine sculptors who can just machine sculpt clay and that's it, but it would have taken a lot longer and you wouldn't have had the exact precision that digital affords. So. Yeah. And I, I see, I am a fan of the old school movie effects. I mean, CGI obviously has its place, but you got to be a little bit irritated with with so many movies and stuff using too much C overuse of CGI. I think sometimes if, it, if it's overused or if it's used in the wrong context, you know, because I was always a big fan of like, well, let's do let's do the arms green screen and they can be puppeteering the arms of the creature. And the VFX guys will usually say, yes, that's what we should do. Let's mm -hmm. not let's not animate the arms. Let's just remove the performer's arms. Because VFX, everybody I've met the last like 10 years, and it only gets better, you know, the VFX only get better. They're saying, we want as much practical on set as you guys can give us, because then we just have to erase some green rods or some black rods or, hmm. you know, things like that. So well, yeah, that... it's, it, yeah, it, yeah, that's, that's where VFX is really coming in extremely handy. There's a project I'm working on right now that I can't say anything about but we're going to be replacing parts of the actor. I said, wouldn't it be f more fun to like make the torso skinnier, make it disappear. And we can digitally replace like with a small, thinner torso or a thinner neck or, you know, and it'd just be creepy. So you can tell the rest of the costume is real. It's physical. It's been built mm -hmm. and you can, you know, the other actors are touching it and interacting with it, but there's something strange about it because you know, there's no actor that's that skinny. Hmm. you know so yeah. those are the places where i love to use digital right when you can trick the audience it's still there it's three-dimensional it's a costume but then you're tricking your audience absolutely there's something wrong with it there's something not quite right with the proportions and that's the magic trick absolutely yeah do you do you ever have uh you must have had movies that you've worked on be reviewed did they mention your work in either a good or a bad way or Oh, sure. I mean, there's always been tons of films where it's like, ah, it was fun. It was suspenseful, like, you know, this and that good performance, but yikes, those makeup effects. <laughs> oh no, like bad ones. So probably more good than bad. I would think though, oh, so based on the stuff. I mean, sometimes great, of course, yeah. you know, but it's like, you know, like, uh, you know, and I can't remember if anybody said anything negative. Like I, I worked on the only Jurassic Park I got to work on was number four. Oh, and I worked on the, uh, the dead, uh, or the dying apatosaur that uh, Chris Pratt walks up to and it's like kind of breathing and they're, they're touching its neck and its head is sort of raising up and it's dying. And uh, so I got to work on that piece, but that was really neat. because that was a full animatronic neck and head, but then it was married perfectly into a digital body of it oh. lying down and like the legs moving and all that. It's all digital. So we just did from like, I don't know, it was like maybe like eight feet or nine feet of that neck to the head. So that's you know, cool. But that was that was one of the things that it's like eh, there's there's animatronics dying right there. <laughs> they replaced every dinosaur in that film. They we didn't even build. That was the only thing we built. Everything was CG. Then wow. the next film that was done was at Jurassic, not Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. I think. That okay, was. I, I don't I think, think I've seen that, that one. Was, it was all shot in all shot in London, I think. Mm. And. Uh, they built tons of dinosaurs for that. Yeah. So they oh, got that's good. The practical. And I, a lot of directors love practical effects. John Favreau, I remember when we were working on the first Iron Man, he loved the practical effects. Yeah. So uh, I heard you he say that. That's really champion that's, of that. That's good. I like, I like it. I mean, it, CGI, like I said, obviously it has its place, but I think that's yeah. good. That. Um, so what is the, like kind of the mental makeup of people in the special effects? Like, do some people think that you guys are crazy that you're obsessed with gore and blood and it's guts? So and funny, stuff? Yeah. That was always the thing early on where it was like, you guys must get this stuff from your nightmares. Or, <laughs> you know, you must be all like twisted and thick. And it's like, no, it's like, 
we're not we're pretty well adjusted people <laughs> yeah you see I mean, like... we might be a bit of like social misfits because all we talk about is star trek and star wars and <laughs> old 50s you know monster movies and stuff but uh you know aside from that we're all really normal people that just like no, nope, I just dream about the same old stuff. We're all naked in high school and just yeah. can't figure out how to get the math class. You know, it's just like I, I don't have horrific dreams of the apocalypse or anything like right. that. Right? Oh, I gotta build that. You know? No, I, I mean, I, th I really, I think I admire your persistence and how you kept on trying. You said there was a couple times where you thought of maybe quitting. So what kept you going? It, you know, there was definitely early on. There was a there was a moment with uh, John Beekler's where I'd been off for a good chunk of time. And I got to a point where I wasn't working. I was trying to find work. Nobody was hiring. Mm. Beekler wasn't hiring. And I was literally down to pocket change. You know, I was wow. just gassing up my car with like, you know, it's like, well, I've got, let's see, 375 here. I'll, you know, put that, I had a big, big bucket of change that I kept. And, um, you know, I'd drive into John Beekler's shop every day because I was sculpting and I'm working because somebody had always told me too, it's like, just constantly be working. Mm. And they said, Beekler will let you come in the shop and work on your own things. And he oh. did. And so I would come in. And so I was always there and present. And it's like, I'm still here. Haven't left, <laughs> waiting to work. And yeah, I, I got a call from another shop and they said, you know, or Beekler's did. And they said, you got anybody over there that could do And he, Oh, well, Ted's here and he's not doing anything. He's just working on his own thing. We'll send him over. And that went on for several days until the guy finally just kind of hired me full time for like several weeks and prepaid me some money. And it's like, Oh my God, you know, I just left that job. Cause I was getting close to like, I don't know if this is going to work out. Oh my God. You know? That's scary. And so that turned into something. Beekler got another job and that just snowballed. So it's like, you know, there's only been a couple of times where I just kind of like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work, mm. you know, but really that was, that was probably the worst. Okay. Well, know? I'm glad that it did. Cause you, it sounds like you worked on so many cool things. That's really exciting. Yeah. No, um, was great. Well, I, like, I always like to end each episode with a charity. Is there one that you want yeah. to give a quick shout out to here? No. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, these guys that I worked with uh, or guys, one guy uh, um, years ago through the Stan Winston school that I've done tons of tutorials for that, um, that online, uh, school event. But, um, this guy, uh, Ryan Weimer, uh, who does magic wheelchair. And, uh, he's got a couple of kids that were afflicted with, um, uh, what is it? Um, MD, uh, muscular dystrophy oh. and, uh, uh, things like that. So it's these, these kids that are wheelchair bound and, um, he started doing for his own kids was building costumes that went around their wheelchair and connected oh, to their wheelchair. I've seen some of these on the internet, I think. Yeah. And so Ryan started this with his kids and then turned it into a Kickstarter fundraising thing. And now it's just exploded. These people all over the country are building these amazing wheelchair kind of costumes for kids, yeah. either for Comic-Con or for Halloween. And it doesn't cost anything to the family. You can go on their site and, and donate, you know, either do a one-time donation or, you know, you can volunteer to build one of the magic wheelchairs and just, you get go on their site. Okay. I, I wrote it down, magicwheelchair.org. Okay. I'll put that in the notes for everybody. They can yeah. click that. And then obviously you got some stuff to promote. You do some classes. You have a Patreon. I think you have an Etsy store, YouTube channel. Yeah. What I else? I don't do Patreon yet. Um, okay. But uh, I've got all the old, the tutorials I'd done with the Stan Winston school. Um, tons of fabrications like muscle building and creature building and stuff like that. I had done with Stan Winston school, but of course I've got my Instagram page, which is foam faber. I've got, um, my Facebook page was, is, a uh, Ted Haynes foam faber. And I've got an Etsy store where I've got some drawings and, um, you know, some pins and stickers and goofy things like that, that you'd find on my Instagram page as well. So, and there's a link on my Instagram for all that stuff. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks yeah, so I'm much, just, Ted. I'm just working all the time. Yeah. So. Cute. Well, I'll let you get back to it then. Thanks for taking the time to do my show. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. Thanks so much. It was fun. All right. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So fascinating hearing all about behind the scenes. I always wondered about the blood and guts in movies and how close that was to the real thing. And it, it sounds like it's totally fake, which uh, it makes sense if you think about it because they need to spice it up a little bit for the big screen. And uh, I loved all his stories and I learned so much. 
uh, from Ted. Did you enjoy this episode? Uh, let me know what you think in the comments on YouTube or social media. And uh, make sure to follow Ted on social media and his YouTube channel. And then you can uh, keep up with what he's up to. Uh, it sounds like he's always got some big projects on the horizon. Uh, and as always, you can support my show on social media and YouTube with comments, shares, likes, and subscribes. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And remember to shoot for the moon.